Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you all for coming and uh, I hope that what we have to say is of interest on this uh, particular day. The presentation that uh, I'm to make is based on our conversations in Athens and on a review subsequently of the background of some of the aspects of the story which relate to the interaction between Greece and the European Community and the European Union. Right. Start by putting before you two quotations, two views. One from Prime Minister Papandreou within the last week, saying that it, it basically that it's been proven that the crisis is not a Greek crisis, it's a European crisis, and now is the time for Europe to act. The other view is one that came from many of our interlocutors. This is a composite of views expressed to us by many people in Athens. The future is dependent on political will. The crisis has its origins in grave defects in the Greek political system over decades. Recovery requires much more than wise economic management. It requires the remaking of Greece's whole political and institutional system. And I try to pull those two things together as I go along. Slide two is just an outline of what follows, and don't be scared, it doesn't mean you're here for the whole afternoon, it's just an attempt to indicate a line of logic from Greece's entry, Greece's entry to the European community through to dealing with the current crisis. <coughs> so, let's start with the insight from the second quote that this is the story that spans decades. And one could go back here uh, very far into, in, into the history, certainly of the 20th century, back to civil war, to Nazi, Nazi occupation to the exile of political leaders. But let's start in 1959. Greece applied for membership of the European community in 1959, well before Ireland applied. But it didn't get membership. It was offered an association agreement in 1961. This was suspended in 1967 when the generals took power, but it was reactivated in 1974 with the restoration of democracy. This immediately was followed by a second application for membership and uh, this was submitted in 75. There were long negotiations with the Commission at the time expressing doubts about the structures uh, of the Greek economy and its preparedness for membership. But there was an, an accession agreement in 1979 and entry in 1981. And of course, the overriding consideration at this time and the correct one was that Greece had to be uh, brought into the European family after emerging from the experience of, of, of the generals. And of course, at around the same time, both Spain and Portugal, emerging from their uh, fascist past, had applied for membership. So this was part of a preparation for what might be called a post-fascist enlargement of the Union, a cementing of democracy. Greece entered in 1981, and almost immediately afterwards, there was a general election in which the government changed. Andreas Papandreou led PASOK into power on a dual commitment that he would lead Greece out of the capitalist European community and out of the US-dominated NATO. But as so often happens, once installed into ministerial office, they discovered that leaving was not really an option, that reality demanded that they stay with the, with the agreement that had been made, and they had to find a way uh, to achieve this. Enter Commissioner Richard Burke, the Irish commissioner at the time, starting his second term in, in the Commission and given a task by President Gaston Thorne. And I'm quoting from Richard Burke himself speaking from this podium or from the, the predecessor podium several years ago in this house. It was to find a political solution to the stated intention of the Greek government to negotiate with the community with a view to abandoning its pledge to leave the, the, the community. And the Greek government were asked to provide a memorandum setting out their case. And this is very significant. The memorandum is an extraordinary document, March 1982, starting off by saying that the economy of Greece differed markedly from that of the community as regards both its level of development and its structures. And it then went on to speak about the structural defects of the Greek economy. And, and um, sorry. Can I go back? Yeah, just visit the memorandum. Huh? Which one? Sorry. Um, yeah. The, the Greek government defined its own defects as follows. An overdeveloped tertiary sector, a widespread black economy, 
a pronounced degree of what they called parasitism, which being interpreted meant a huge public sector. And that was up to 48% of GDP two years ago still. Vast military expenditure, between 4 and 5% of GDP annually. A black economy in areas like tourism. Parasitism in the tax system, in non-compliance on tax, corruption, and a politicised public service. It's spoke about underdeveloped agriculture, a small processing industry sector, with 85% of enterprises employing more, employing fewer than five persons, underemployment in many sectors, and social and regional inequalities. Now, the, this memorandum is extraordinary because if you were to change the date from 1982 to 2010, you're talking about almost exactly the uh, profile of the Greek economy that was presented to us at meeting after meeting, and which is uh, absolutely reflected in the EU IMF memorandum uh, statement on, on, on need of reform. The memorandum, however, provided the basis for prolonged negotiation presided over by Richard Burke, with over 200 special missions from Brussels going to Athens in 18 months to work across the whole spectrum of administration and economy. And the outcome was 1984, an agreement to address Greece's concerns with the structural funds, with money and reform packages. This led to a period of economic development in which Greece had strong economic growth right through from the 80s, right through indeed until uh, just a four or five years ago. In fact, between 1995 and 2009, Greece came second to Ireland in terms of the pace of economic growth. This was built on the support of the structural funds and, which, uh, and, and, and the integrated Mediterranean programs, which also helped Spain and Portugal, which represented over all of this period, right up to 2005, at least 4% per annum of GDP, compared to probably 1% or less in, in the case of, of the support for Ireland. And one of the factors of the, of the recent crisis in Greece, of course, was that in 2005, the structural funds were, straight, were changed and the money was diverted to Central and Eastern Europe after the, the 2004 enlargement. And you had a fall from over 4% per annum to about 1% per annum in receipts from the structural funds, leading to a huge problem in terms of the funding of the massive public sector in Greece. Then there's the story... I, I'm, yeah. Then there's the story of entry to the Eurozone. Greece applied uh, and was turned down in the first tranche of membership in 1998 because it didn't meet the, the, the uh, convergence criteria. It applied again in 2000, stating that it now had a dramatic change in circumstances and met the criteria. And the Commission and the ECB agreed and Greece was admitted to the um, Eurozone on the 1st of January 2001. That was two years after the other countries had entered. And this is of extreme importance uh, and significance in terms of, of what su subsequently developed in terms of the crisis. It also has to be said that subsequent to, to entry, there was a, 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 a reconsideration by Eurostat and by the Commission of the Greek statistics and it does appear that uh, the figures on which the changed judgment was made were not uh, absolutely reliable and in fact that there were serious problems in relation to the definition of the Greek public deficit, particularly in relation to the spending on military matters. But we now have a situation where you have the Greek economy as defined in, in the memorandum of 82, this huge public sector uh, uh, e economy with uh, a very low external uh, economic action compared to the 80 or 90 percent that we say of Irish production that must be exported. The Greek equivalent is about 20 percent. It is a very closed economy, very much dominated by the public sector, very much dependent upon the funding coming from, from Brussels and then in the Eurozone now having the opportunity of borrowing money at very low uh, interest rates. And we were told by several people that entry to the Eurozone meant what was called fiscal softening. The budget surpluses of the 90s turned into 
growing regular deficits. These were covered to a considerable degree by the availability of, of structural funds up to 2005 and helped by the low, the low interest rate regime of, of the Eurozone. And then things began to go wrong, the cutback in structural funding and then the recession. And we now moved into a, a situation where uh, a, a country which had been running a budget surplus in the late 90s now had a deficit of 15.5% of GDP in 2009, and a build-up of debt, which as we now know is well over 150% of GDP. All of this coming from the structural issues outlined by the Greek government 20 years earlier. It's very interesting to look at the IMF EU memorandum, apart altogether from the bits that are in the headlines today about haircuts and, and, and so on. It requires so much more than fiscal adjustment. The memorandum calls for action on the scale of the public sector, the cost of the public sector, the need to privatise massive state assets, the need to reduce Greece's abnormally high defence budget, a complete overhaul of the tax and tax collection systems, greater labour market flexibility, major changes in the education system, liberalisation of other key areas, simplification of systems, generally a, 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 an addressing almost line by line of the issues that had been first raised in, in the famous Greek memorandum. The story that we got about all of this was more and more that what we're talking about here is the capacity of the Greek political, governmental and administrative systems to deliver not just fiscal adjustment but real long uh, st uh, standing deep reform. In fact, Prime Minister Papandreou was speaking quite passionately about this yesterday and he certainly understands this, but we're dealing with a country which needs massive reform, and my colleagues will talk about the, the, the politics and the sociology of that in, in a moment or two. It's necessary to stress just one or two more points, and then I'll stop. One is the, to understand the impact of community support programmes. We were told that fiscal imprudence was the result of the community support frameworks, of all of the money that came from Brussels. Some of it was well used, you can see it in the infrastructure around Athens. Some of it was used to subsidise things that should not have been subsidised. You had an inefficient tax system and uh, very low tax take and consequent <coughs> borrowing and more borrowing to keep the public sector moving. And then monetary union was memorably described to us as a, a sleeping pill Monetary Union made it possible to postpone the undertaking of essential reforms. Low interest rates were not matched by stabilisation measures. Bubbles, not as big as our bubble, but bubbles were facilitated and public deficits were allowed to increase because of the failings of the Stability and Growth Pact. There's no doubt that the, the, the Greek economy, as described to us, uh, mirrors problems in the European system which are um, uh, evident and, and which are, I, I think are increasingly being faced up to. Indeed, the, what well, came from the summits of, of yesterday shows uh, a further commitment to dealing with these things. But what particularly uh, comes across was the failing in both the structural fund regime and the euro regime to m match the provision of funds and the provision of, of low interest uh, capital and all of the, the positives from the point of view of the recipient countries with a surveillance and control mechanism which could keep systems on the right track. Basically, the failure or almost non-existence of the stability and growth pact in, 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 uh, in practice and in the presence of Rory Quinn who negotiated the stability and growth pact, the, the fact is that it had been allowed mainly because the, the Germans and the French had got away with flouting it, uh, uh, becoming a very weak instrument indeed. And if ever a country needed it, it was Greece. So finally, um, what one is saying is this. Greece, regardless of, of the outcome of the, um, uh, the current uh, 
negotiations and current resolutions at, 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 the, at the highest level, is a country which has very deep structural problems in its economy, and which are reflected also, as we'll hear, in its political structures. And these have got to be faced up to. And even if the, the current fiscal problem was solved, the, the Greece, which is a member of the Union with us and a member of the Eurozone with us, still has got to bring through these reforms. My colleagues will talk about the, the problems of doing that. But it is, as was said in that first quote, this is a problem that has decades of background. It is not something that has blown up in, in the recent past. And it is rooted in the political system and, and the political history of the country. And it is to the reform of that that all efforts must be, be given. And one thing that was said to us very often was, there are many people in Greece, and we met remarkable people with great insights, who know that these reforms must take place and are committed to them. But they, they not alone need their, to get the, the commitment and the buying into the system of their own people. They need and will continue to need real, strong, consistent and, and constructive support from outside. And that must go hand in hand with uh, whatever fiscal or financial arrangements are being uh, put in place. Someone at dinner one night said to us something that struck me and I wrote, wrote down, and uh, people here know I tend to write lots of notes at meetings, but this one jumped back off the page. He, we were talking about the debates that were going on about reform, and he said, if everything goes well, we're going to have a very modern country. Sorry, I, I stopped this. I'm not good at technology. If everything goes well, we're going to have a very modern country. But if the political system doesn't respond to the needs of the times, we will be bankrupt, worse than Argentina. And uh, that is the challenge that they face and that we face as, as partners in, in, in Europe, uh, particularly in the light of, of the decisions of the last 24 hours. And I pass on now to my colleague, Nigel Green. Thanks. <clears throat>